Welcome to the coin holder meeting. So pleased that you're dialing in. We have assembled our team of leaders here in Zurich and only Sergey will speak from a distant location. So you all know that Lucky is building a marketplace for the free exchange of financial assets. That's our objective. So let us look back at what happened over the last 12 months. It started with a crypto bull run, which enabled us, Liquid, to also initiate rapid growth. In the background, you saw that suddenly fees started to explode and the original model of building a semi-decentralized exchange became unfeasible because fees just exploded. So we had to move to a centralized exchange in December. It has to be said that during the course, this impacted the development of our other products and initiated a consolidation phase for kind of launching our next expansion. So let me try to explain where we are. We'll present here first myself, the organizational structure, then give you an update on the transition by Nicholas. Financials will be presented by Philip Richner, then the user base and statistics of our current users by Marina de Matos, Key metrics by Sergey. Product will be outlined and the vision by Mika Weber. Then liquidity, all report. And then marketing, Laura Arcade. She'll also tell us about the field. And finally, regulations by Ivan de Calceres. So, key in this rapid changing space, which currently the crypto market is going through a consolidation phase, but it will be very soon that the next wave of expansion will start, and it's their key that we can execute fast as a truly agile company. So what does the structure look like today? We have at the board level, myself, Heinrich Zettelmeier, and Julian Zirko. Julian Zirko has been instrumental for us to help us transition the company and set up the right agile structures. His background comes out of working in emerging countries which have had crises and knows a lot about what happens when the world is changing fast and how to build kind of powerful teams. Look at future. In this transition, it's key that we already now position ourselves to have the next future products, which include having the kind of next decentralized exchange. So we have to think what is the blockchain of the future, but also other issues like stable coins, etc. So Mika and Sergey are kind of in charge of that. Obviously, I'll try to contribute there as well. So the organizational structure looks as follows. We have centralized functions, which provide kind of facilities across the board to then the actual product. So let me outline. At the enterprise level, this is human resources, uh, kind of including legal, then finance, and then the actual products includes risk security, marketing, products, fintech, engineering, customer success and field. So the setup is structured in such a way that each head of a group and his people can act autonomously, but depend in a bigger whole so that there is cross dependency. So we have been able luckily to fill uh, marketing products, FinTech is still open, engineering, I'll go through the details in a minute. So Andre Migin, thanks to him, the products that you today have are there. He runs engineering, Marina de Matos, next to me. She is in charge of customer success. It's key that we want to provide a truly awesome experience, not an experience where there are delays in responding, but trying to anticipate the problems which are there. Mika Verwe is head of product and has kind of mapped out the rollout of the next products, and he'll give you an, an update later on. Laura Kade is in charge of marketing. She has a lot of experience from the background of how to market to the masses, how to get the product out to the real world. <coughs> Nick Harwood 
has deep experience from working in banks, but not just in banks that are in markets such as Switzerland, UK, but knows what it means in an emerging marketplace like Russia, which is a key experience in the crypto world because the crypto world is changing rapidly and we need hands-on experience. So let me hand over now to the transition update, which will be done by Nick. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, and, uh, and, and welcome to everyone and thanks for joining. In terms of the transition journey, it's a, it's a story really of three phases at this point in time, but I think very importantly before I go through them, um, I want to focus on the last point, that being continuous optimization. This is a rapidly changing space we find ourselves in, and part of the reason we, em we embarked on the transition operation and exercise was to true up where we were given the fast rate of change in this business. Lique 1.0, Richard, the founders, and many, many people in the greater organization made substantial investments in technology um, as, as, as well as regulation, product development, and growth was largely or, um, organic through this period. In the transition phase, we stood back, looked at where we were, uh, built on the learnings from previous phases, reviewed our strategy, and importantly, have refocused our resources on proven models and put in place an executive team to deliver. And Richard's spoken something about that so far. In terms of going forward now, from the point marked where we are, it's now about implementation of, of, of the new business model, deployment of enterprise-grade and scalable organizational systems and infrastructure. And with that, we'll be able to accelerate customer acquisition, product rollout, and the execution of our regulatory strategy. Uh, to quote, you know, this phase, the focus is on optimization at scale and using momentum to trigger new product cycles and innovation. In terms of the goals, in terms of LICA 2.0, uh, the overall purpose of the transition phase was to, was, was to move forward into Lickey 2.0, and there have been four aspects of that. Completing our global brand <coughs> positioning platform, Marina and Laura will speak about that and the works we've done with the likes of Kantar. Implementing the new organizational design, which is built around lean principles, but importantly, accountability. Richard's highlighted that, and we'll talk more about it building and activating the leadership team, and we've made tremendous progress in that regard, and then implementing predictable processes that maximize output across the whole organization, and through doing so, shareholder returns. From June 2008, you know, the theme here is forward in partnership. The reason we, we, we stress partnership is the way forward is building on a lot of the successes in the past. A key, a key aspect of that, in addition to the nine functions you see above, is the interface with the Founders Forum, Michael and, uh, and Sergey, uh, to, to make sure we are able to leverage what we've done. Um, where we are now, as mentioned, most leadership positions have been filled, but two more in progress. Um, Key, uh, key success, success metrics have been defined for the company overall and for all the teams. We've also made meaningful progress on regulatory strategy. Um, I mentioned earlier that this is a rapidly evolving space, and as we've, we've interfaced with regulators and partners, we've trued up what we wanted to do and what we think we can do in the near term and how it fits with our longer term strategy. To that end, the focus is now four square on working with the Swiss regulators to get the rollout of our Swiss OTF. We're very close, we believe, to, to, to getting our investment license in Cyprus. We had the final audit last week with the regulators. And given the, 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 the complexities and scale in the US business, we've paired back that strategy. And Philip will speak about that later in terms of his financial numbers. Also importantly, because this is very much a business about where the 
the old and the new worlds come together to create a, fr a, a frictionless environment. We can only do that by, 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 by working with, identifying and strengthening strategic alliances with key partners to ensure that LICA is able to deliver a leading edge digital financial service offering. And these partners include the likes of financial institutions, regulators, as well as other fintech companies. It's, it, it, it's absolutely key that we have a full understanding of, of how the space is evolving. And we spend a great deal of time building those relationships. In terms of the final slide, but, uh, before I hand over to Philip, um, I wanted to, do, to, to, to talk to uh, one of the outcomes of our refocus, a company called Blockchain Valley Ventures. This has been a spin-off from Lique. Uh, we're now a very important shareholder in this business. It's an accelerator and venture capital firm offering investment, financing, and advisory services for blockchain-enabled businesses. It's complementary to what we do, but not core to what we do. And as a shareholder in this business, Lique, the, the, the coin holders and investors in Lique will benefit in value uplift in terms of BVV going forward. And this is just one example of how, as we develop our strategy, the, the, the focus is constantly on delivering our goals, but as well as delivering value to shareholders. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Philip. Thank you very much, Philip. Thank you, Nick. Um, in the next few minutes, I'd like to walk with you through the financials of 2017. First, we will start with the Lucke Group, with the Lucke Corp financials. These um, financials were audited by Grant Thornton last week, and we performed an audit there. All of we are le not legally obliged to do it, but for us, it's a strong commitment to our goal of being compliant from the beginning. Next, we will have a look at the consolidated financials. There, the audit will commence um, in the next days. And to conclude, we will touch on some of the key elements that will have an impact on the financials 2018. Let's begin with the asset side of the balance sheet from Blicke Corp. First, I'd like to acclimate you to the structure, as you will see the same format on all the slides. Um, the numbers are presented in thousands of Swiss francs, and on the right side column you see the numbers from 2016, and in the middle, the one from 2017. If we start on top, you see cash and cash equivalents, where we reported last year um, 550,000. Um, and this number grew during the year from 550,000 to 3.8 million, which is mainly due to the overall growth in value of the crypto assets. If we go down to the trade accounts or to all the receivables, you see year over year there isn't a big change, it's relatively flat. Um, in 2017, Lika activity ramped up significantly across a number of geographies and specialized entities. This is demonstrated in the financial asset line, where we see an increase from 0 0.1 to 734,000 Swiss francs, which represents regulatory and share capital in our subsidiaries. If we go to the liability and shareholders equity side, you see a strong increase in liabilities from 2016 to 2017. And this is mainly due to increased intercompany activities. And also our taxable gain from 2017 created a deferred tax liability. Um, despite the fact that we issued the one and the two year coin respectively token uh, during last year, there was no change in share capital, which means that both um, tokens or coins were backed by existing shares from the treasury, and also there was no dilution of the existing shareholders. Positively, profit and loss for the year um, improved from a loss of 746,000 in 2016 <coughs> to a gain in last year of roughly 2.2 million Swiss francs. The appropriation of earnings is to retain 100% of it and use it to finance the future growth of the company, as well, of course, 
first we have to offset the accumulated losses of roughly 920,000 Swiss francs. We will now move to the income statement and review the drivers behind this profitable outcome of last year. As you can see, um, the operating income or the, the income from project and advisory grew rapidly from roughly 160,000 to more than 2.6 million, which is um, linked to our ongoing focus on developing productive relationship with third parties. The grew in other income of roughly 2.6 million is mainly linked to intercompany rebuildings with one or with several of our 16 subsidiaries and is offset by growth in um, operating costs which are reported below. As Nick outlined earlier, the new strategy um, regarding the US business um, that we won't um, follow up on this strategy or on this business at the moment. Due to this adjustment in strategy, we had to report an um, impairment on our investments there. This is also part of the operating expenses. The financial result grew um, by roughly 6.8 million and is driven primarily by foreign exchange gains, which as you can see, contributes materially to our bottom line result. <coughs> Taking all these factors into account, we have a gain for the year of 2.2 million Swiss francs. Now let's move on to the consolidated financials. And I have to put a disclaimer here that these numbers are subject to potential change based on the review from Grant Thornton. And if we compare the, the balance sheet number from the consolidation to the Liquid Corp standalone, we see the importance of the UK, of the exchange business, as um, client accounts drive the comparative increase both in assets and liabilities. And so for me, it's important to highlight here that all liabilities to clients are backed either by receivables from credit card providers crypto assets or cash on bank accounts. Also here we see that on a consolidated view, we have we report a profit for over 4.6 million for 2017. On the slide here, we will go again through the drivers um, of this positive uh, outcome from last year. And you see again, UK contributed very much to the operating income because if you keep in mind that out of this 11.9 million Swiss francs, 2.7 million comes from projects and advisory, and the rest, the residual 9.2 million comes mainly from the UK exchange. Also, as highlighted earlier, um, operating expenses grew significantly to um, support the business growth. And as well, if we look at the operationing operation results, we are still in a loss position of two point, roughly 2.3 million, but offsetting it with the financial result of 7.3 million, we have in the end the gain of 4.6 million, which is, I think, a very good result um, for last year. And to conclude, the um, financial segments of this presentation I'd like to highlight three key trends that will impact our financials in 2018. One of the key positive drivers last year was our ability to capitalize on the asset or on the growth in value of the crypto asset. And as everybody knows, this trend has reversed in 2018 and will impact negatively on our financials. Also outlined by Richard and Nick earlier, our focus this year has been on consolidation and transition into Lycke 2.0. And as you all saw in the last months, the, the, there was an impact on user growth, volume and overall activity, which of course has also a, a financial impact. But we expect from in the second half that we will get momentum and traction from the rollout of the new strategy in, in the hands of the executive team 
and this momentum should translate into increased activity and revenues on the exchange side. With these three statements, I like to close the financial part of my presentation and hand it over to Marina. Thank you, Philip. So I'm now going to talk a little bit about the user base and some of the metrics we have there. I will try to paint a picture of where we are at the moment and where we would like to go. So as you can see on that slide, we have the number of accounts open. And those are new accounts open on a monthly basis. You can see there that there is a spike in the months of December, January, and February. And that's down to the market interest in cryptocurrency. On the other months, they go back to being stable and they are around 4,000 accounts per month. This is a very key statistic, piece of the statistics for us, and we'll be looking into it more and more in the following months as we want to attract the users to our platform. And in, for that, we have already done a good bit. We have a market unit hired, as it was mentioned already by Richard and Nick. And as Rich and Nick mentioned, we have done some qualitative research with Gantar in which we are looking at ways of attracting new users. On this graph, you can see the active users, and that means the users who are trading on our platform on a daily basis. You see the same trends uh, in December, January, and in this case, February, and it's down to the same reasons of the market interest in cryptocurrency, and you see that, again, it stabilized a bit more. This is a key piece of statistics for the customer success unit. We will look into it on a monthly basis and monitor it as we want people to come to our platform and not just trade and then go and move on, but we want them to come in and stick to the platform. So by analyzing all the data that we have, we will then try to make them stay and trade more and more and therefore have more active users generating more liquidity to the market. And the last slide that we have is also very key for the customer success team and an interesting piece of statistics. We have here the number of registered users versus the K their KYC status. You can see on the red line there the total of accounts that we have on a monthly basis. And you can see on the blue, light blue bit, the unverified users. That means the ones who have not passed KYC. And you can see that there is a gap between the registered users versus the ones that have passed completed full KYC. And the interesting bit of that is that if we breach the gap, we will make sure that the users are actually availing of all the products that we have on our platform. And as I said, we want them to stay in the platform and use our products on a daily basis. The users can still trade if they do not pass KYC, but they are not able to avail of everything. So we will look into it, make sure to get to that point, we'll make sure that the user experience is as smooth as possible so that they can avail of everything and use our platform on a daily basis. I will now pass you to Sergey, who will be talking a bit more about other metrics. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, happy to greet you from Verona to join this conference. Um, let me give you a brief overview of uh, the trading activity on Liquid Platform for the last uh, year. And uh, looking at the trading volume, uh, you see the same more or less profile. There is a uh, really high peaks in, in the end of last year, early, early this year, but it's uh, getting uh, a bit uh, uh, declining due to the, um, the reversal of the trend. Uh, we, as you see this red uh, areas, is the uh, high frequency trading volume. In total, it now accounts for around 15% or uh, 200 million for, for the year, uh, for the last year. And our overall volume, which was traded on the platform last year, was um, slightly around $1.4 billion, which, uh, 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 which is around 100 million per month on average, and around 3 million per day. Uh, uh, it's, it's only spot volume, it's, uh, there is no accounting for it's not mentioned for the market trading volume, which gives an additional of $115 million uh, on total uh, for the past year. Um, <clears throat> uh, in May, uh, there's a spike. We have launched um, a web terminal, and there was an active uh, high frequency trading, um, which, uh, which is quite remarkable. Uh, on the next slide, you see the, the structure of the volume on the platform. Uh, it's um, 
uh, still that uh, most of the volume comes from the uh, core of the trading is the four uh, FX um, for 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 currencies like uh, euro, Swiss franc, USD, and British pound, which we settle in, and uh, those uh, coupled with the Bit Bitcoin and Ether. In total, those pairs uh, between each other gives around 90% of the volume. Um, around 8% comes from the trading of LKK, LKM uh, coins, and LKK um, forwards. Uh, one year and two year forwards, and three percent is uh, from the uh, altcoins such as solar coin, litecoin, and the new added uh, ERC20 tokens. On the next slide, you uh, you would see the um, the evolution of the net cash ins in fiat in the platform. Uh, it is monthly, uh, month by month cumulative uh, data. So you would see that the, the end of before the end of last year there was a, a large inflow of the fiat funds into the platform. So people were essentially uh, getting into the crypto and uh, accumulating the positions. But uh, starting from March until let's say probably only last week, people were reversing. So they were actually selling crypto and going to the into fiat. Uh, so um, but recently last week there is kind of. Um, a reversal of this um, uh, trend, and so on average is two million months per month inflow uh, uh, into the um, uh, cash accounts, but it's very much different by month, as you see. On the next slide, you see uh, the, our kind of state of uh, net liquidity on, on, of uh, liquid uh, exchange. Uh, the cash uh, has, from the last uh, date we reported, is first of June. Last year, it, the cash has tripled uh, to 15.5 million um, USD, and it matches with the liabilities. So um, all the uh, fiat liabilities, like color coins, are covered with the cash on, on the bank accounts. And in addition, there is 1.3 million of uh, cryptocurrency position of uh, uh, Liquid itself, and uh, which gives an liquidity of 1.3. A million USD uh, as of 1st of June this year. And in addition to, to strengthen this financial uh, position, we have been raising the addition of 4 million um, uh, uh, to, to improve the, the capital and, and liquidity. Uh, so, uh, to, uh, to continue with the products, I would like to hand over now to, to Mikhail. Oh, thanks a lot, Sergei. So, hey everyone. Uh, so, I'd like to start with a, a few words about the, uh, the improvements that we've made internally with the teams. Uh, so, during the transition period, and especially during the last four months, uh, we have transitioned from teams that were silos to cross-functional product teams. So now, every product has a dedicated team, and every team has, uh, is led by a product owner, and the product owner acts as a bridge between the business side and the tech side. <clears throat> uh, most of the team also transitioned to a, a more agile way of working, and they are basically adapting the Scrum framework to their needs in order to increase uh, the development velocity. And we've already witnessed uh, noticeable improvements in communication, predictability, and our capacity to plan uh, that is obviously uh, appreciated internally. Now, really on the products, uh, so during the transition period, we really wanted to focus on the core. So we did a lot of background work. Uh, we, we fixed the technical depths. We were focusing on improving the security and identifying the UX bottlenecks. Uh, we also prioritized the delivery of our web trading platform because it's now clear to us that a lot of people are not comfortable tra trading on the mobile and so that they expect to have uh, the same Lique experience, but on the web. We've taken the time to conceptualize, to design and plan the next product iterations. And here the goal was really to find ways to simplify the user experience, make it more accessible and streamline the user flow. So we now have a dedicated uh, customer success team that is really helping with that. And I want to, to stress that we listen at every comments uh, and feedback from the community. So we are always on the social media and on Telegram, and we, we actually collect everything and we use this to improve our products. 
Uh, the next improvement in terms of uh, UX will be visible in the next redesign of the Leaky wallets and also in the delivery of our web trading platform and both are expected to be delivered this summer, so Q3 this year. Now I want to give you a little sneak peek of the mobile redesign. So on this, uh, we really worked hard to, uh, to simplify the app structure. So we want that the new users that are onboarding shouldn't have, you know, they shouldn't need more than two or three taps to access any uh, major action in the app. Uh, we improve the navigation and we also work to improve the overall readability uh, of the app. So we can't wait for you to uh, actually try it. On the web now, so some of you, of you may know already the web terminal. Uh, so we continue to work on this one. Uh, recently, we've made a lot of progress on the performance side. So I think it really starts to, uh, to look good. Uh, and we are in parallel working on bringing the KYC on the web and the, the funds management section. So the idea again is to, is to be able to onboard users fully on the web uh, so that they can go through the KYC and then manage their funds, so do deposits, withdrawals for both crypto and fiat uh, on the web. Now, I've talked about the, uh, the core products, uh, but Lique is still an innovative company. So during the transition period, we actually kept working in the background on some innovative products. And the one I want to talk about today is the Algo Store. So the Algo Store is a web platform uh, that is basically allowing anyone to do algo trading. So you go on the platform, even if you don't have, you know, high tech or financial skills, you pick an algo, you can, you can uh, look at the ratings and comments from the community, you can read the code if you're interested, and then you tweak, you tweak a few parameters and you just run it. So at first you run it with a fake, uh, you know, fake money, with a fake wallet on past data, and then when you are confident that the algorithm will do, will do fine, you can, with, with one click, just launch the algorithm in your actual funds. So we are really making algo trading simple. So it's obviously interesting for newbies, but it's also interesting for advanced traders because the way we build this, uh, the algorithms are actually running in our infrastructure, so the latency is really, really low. This uh, product is actually close to be a minimum viable product, and so we expect expect the first beta to be um, available also this summer, Q3 this year. Now, I'd like to end this presentation by saying that the future of Lique is not only about trading. We need to, you know, we need to remember that the crypto market is still in its infancy. It's not mainstream yet, and for now, it's mostly about um, about trading and speculating. But in the future, you know, the blockchain is more about removing borders, digitizing any kind of assets, and allowing anyone to actually invest in, uh, in those assets. And so in order to truly democratize finance, we need an ecosystem of apps that are accessible, reliable, and easy to use. So we've done the market research with uh, Kantar, and this really helped us refine the product vision and we believe that with um, the ecosystem of apps that we are uh, building now, uh, we will be able to broaden our audience uh, to reach a quick and sustainable growth. So the new products are for now at the concept phase, uh, but you will definitely get more info about them before the end of the year. So on that, I will hand over to Richard to talk about the liquidity. Thank you. Happy to kind of discuss liquidity. As we're all aware, who uses a service like Luke, is liquidity is key. If you don't have good prices at which to trade, there is no uh, user experience that is satisfactory. So it's a key passport requirement. So we're currently focusing on improving liquidity, and there are basically two strategies to achieve that goal. One is external, and the other one is in-house. So let me go through this. So the external strategy is actually that you, as a user, contribute to liquidity. And the more retail users we have, the more liquidity is added to the system just by your presence. Now, professionals 
and this is our aim, is we want to also be attractive to professionals that <laughs> provide liquidity. But the key challenge of the professionals is that they can swamp the market with making too big orders. So the strategy of Luke is to have zero fees. You don't have to trade and be paid. But in future, we'll have the institutional players, when they make very big orders in phases when there is a lack of liquidity, they have to pay smart fees, which kind of is a deterrent uh, for them to do that. So it's turning fees in the institutional sector into a smart tool to improve liquidity. This is, will be developed as we go forward. The user base, and therefore, is key to providing liquidity. So marketing and bringing out the product around the world is key to improving liquidity. Then what Mika explained, the algo store, the ability for you to trade with very low risk and to have a positive management of that <coughs> is covered by the algo store. And finally is we're tapping into and talking to market makers who make markets on other exchanges to do the same thing on Luke. So that's the external strategy to improve liquidity. So a brief update on what we do in-house. So as we speak, we are developing the market making engine and starting to release it. So when you go to, for example, see at Bitcoin US dollar order book, you'll gradually see our limit orders from our market making engine that are appearing to improve liquidity. We also do integration with other exchanges so that we can mirror their liquidity onto our exchange. But this requires extensive cash and risk management tools, and this is key to our current activity to deploy that. For the illiquid instruments, the alpha engine is key, but that will be kind of released over time as the first three elements are fully functional. So it's the current focus is to focus on those instruments which also on other exchanges have a lot of liquidity. Finally, we'll long term hope to and plan to launch investment products that themselves provide liquidity and in a sense give you as an investor also the opportunity to invest products without having to manage your assets individually to achieve performance. So you can just have a one-stop solution. So let me hand over to marketing <coughs> and I give you more. Yes, uh, thank you, Richard. Um, so as it was mentioned before, uh, so now we have a new marketing uh, team. Um, and so really the role of uh, the marketing team um, is for us to accelerate customer acquisition and uh, product rollout. Um, so um, our biggest, actually, the success metric that we look at as marketing is really the number of registered users, uh, because our goal is really to grow the user base. So today we have 90,000 um, registered users, and so we've set out a goal uh, to achieve by the end of, by the end of 2019. Um, 650,000 registered users. Um, so that's a very exciting challenge. Um, and so I'll give you a little bit of um, info in terms of how we plan on actually uh, getting to that goal. Um, so um, I think it's all about, uh, specifically uh, within Linkage, it's all about getting the basics right when it comes to uh, marketing. Since this is a very new uh, team, let's say, uh, within Linkage, we are um, starting almost from scratch. Um, but we have already, uh, within Linkage, a lot of very talented people. Um, so we are basically building on that strong base. Um, and so we're um, actually right now trying to reinforce the marketing team. Um, and we've done uh, some work um, before, which um, uh, it was mentioned by Marina and also by Nick. Uh, we've done some work uh, in June uh, with Kantar, and which um, and you've heard it already a few times today. But be it's because this work is really a foundation uh, for us in terms of. Um, defining the right positioning, um, defining as well a positioning that is very differentiated from the competition. We all know that the competition is pretty fierce in the crypto world. So this, we needed that work to kind of start us off on the right um, 
on the right on the right uh, track, let's say. Um, so through that research that we did with Kantar, it was a qualitative research um, done uh, by interviewing people and um, um, studying their um, their uh, habits when it comes to cryptocurrency, to um, financial management, um, and the different financial tools that they were using. We, Kantar, uh, talked to people uh, in different countries, um, so in India, in uh, Switzerland, um, in South Africa. Um, so it's a very uh, diverse um, group of customers um, that we were able to look, uh, to tap into. and. Basically, through that research, we gathered a lot of very uh, deep and interesting insights in terms of how people approach uh, personal finance and the cryptocurrency world. Um, and we are basically, in turn, trying to turn those insights into uh, a brand strategy and use those insights um, for our uh, positioning, and they can also inform uh, the product vision, as Mika mentioned. Um, just to give you a little bit of a, a sense in terms of a timeline that we're looking at um, when it comes to the brand strategy development process. So as I said, uh, within the Q2 of 2018, uh, our focus was on aligning the consumer proposition. Um, and so that's um, where the Kantar study um, was helping us. Um, then it's about designing a business proposition. So that's some work that we're doing between Q2 and Q3. Q3, 2018, um, Q3, we're already trying to develop the global communication platform. Um, we are also preparing at the same time uh, the market launch. Um, and then Q3 and Q4 uh, will execute uh, the market entry uh, at a global level and also at a local level. So I'll actually talk about it in, uh, in the field piece. Um, and so now I'm actually passing it on to myself um, because since we don't have a head of field, um, I'll just talk about field um, today. Um, so basically, uh, for those of you who are not really familiar with uh, what the field team uh, will do within the UK, um, it's really about um, helping us um, keep up to date with the latest regulatory developments in different parts of the world. Um, as you all know, it goes really, really fast in the crypto world, so there's always something new. And so it's really key to have people on the ground who can really um, help us uh, stay uh, current uh, when it comes to regulation. Um, it will also provide us with uh, localization feedbacks on how to best enter different markets, and it will be the anchoring point of uh, contact for stakeholders in their respective region. So, um, this, in this, on this map, you can see uh, basically as uh, hubs that we have selected on each uh, continent, throughout LK in a swift and evil manner. Um, so, as you can see in Europe, um, we have uh, the largest operations uh, geography with uh, the LK headquarter in uh, Zug in Switzerland. And then we have uh, the UK exchange and the Netherlands exchange, and we also have Cyprus. And so, basically, uh, those are um, under uh, the direction of uh, Dr. Dimitrios Tamboglio. Um, then in uh, Asia Pacific, uh, we have a hub in uh, Singapore, which is edited by uh, Cheng Wei. Um, in Middle East, we also have uh, a presence in Dubai, uh, which is edited by Manuel Hensink. Um, in uh, South Africa, uh, we in Africa, sorry, we have a hub in South Africa, headed by Toby Mandersby. And in America, we have a very light presence at the moment, as it was mentioned by uh, by Nick. Um, and those efforts are led by uh, Victor Magnacci. Um, in terms of the field uh, strategy, we've basically identified uh, two different go-to-market models for Lique, as you can see on the side. Um, so the first one is uh, Lique Lite, and it's basically uh, a way for us to enter a new market quickly with minor adjustments to the Lique product, such as assets filtering, um, to ensure compliance. Um, Liquidite is really meant to enter markets that have no regulations governing cryptocurrency exchanges and um, who has not banned, uh, which have not banned uh, such activity. Um, we usually expect uh, the rate of growth to be high for Liquidite model in the short term as regulation catch up. 
uh, to lead us to leaky local. Um, so as you can see on the slide, so some possible use cases for leaky light are Singapore, Dubai, and South Africa. And then we have a second model, which is uh, leaky local. Um, and basically, in when we talk about leaky local, it's about a local presence and permanent, permanent establishment um, is that it is required for our operations. Um, usually this is due to uh, local regulations or due to certain products that we wish to offer from that jurisdiction. Um, often we may see markets in legal light migrating to legal local when required by regulation. Um, and the purpose of legal local entity entities would be to create a regulated business that will ensure sustainability in our growth. Um, I will now pass it on to Ivan who will talk um, about regulation. Yes, thank you, uh, Laura, and uh, welcome everyone also from me. Um, first of all, in terms of regulation, over the past uh, 12 months, we've seen a lot of regulatory activity, um, mainly because of the huge increase in crypto trading. A lot of regulators have felt the need to pull these activities within their scope. Um, some, in general, we've seen that on the classification of the token side that a lot of these tokens which before were considered to be uh, unregulated have now come become regulated more in the us we've seen that and also in switzerland um, we've seen some of that um, and also there have been some uh, specifically on exchanges there also have been some guidance but very little actually so for example recently in uh, in Cambodia, um, we've seen that the regulators have banned crypto trading, and in Japan, there have been uh, crypto exchange regulation into play. But most of the uh, of the, the regulatory statements that we saw came actually uh, were focused on the classification of tokens and how to regulate ICOs specifically. Um, about our regulatory strategy for the exchange that we operate, so there's there's basically two uh, drivers of the strategy. Um, first, the one that I already briefly mentioned is that we have seen a trend whereby tokens that were formerly considered to be completely unregulated and uh, there not being any need for a license for trading these tokens have now actually become regulated tokens. So we've seen that in the US and Switzerland specifically um, with quite clear guidance, um, not entirely clear, so, but, but quite clear on when tokens um, are actually to be treated the same as securities. Um, this means that for the trade trading of these products, there will there will come a need uh, for regulated exchanges to trade these on. Um, and we also expect this trend only to increase globally um, instead of reverse. So that is also so we expect regulators around the world actually to, to follow this trend um, and to to consider all of these tokens or at least a large majority of these tokens to be investment products. At the same time, uh, it has always been Lick's vision to offer a broad range of financial products. Um, so all kinds of, of products that can be classified as, as financial products that we currently also known. I mean, the, the, uh, our own LKK is a good example of that. And there, there are many other uh, very interesting uh, token models that we see emerging, but for which there is no uh, license exchange to to offer a fully compliant trading venue for these tokens. So that is what our regulatory strategy is, is based on in a nutshell. So for this, what we need is, is a license to operate a regulated exchange, um, so a marketplace for regulated instruments. And we have, of course, um, always looked around the world for where that would be the best way to do that. We have also invested in many different jurisdictions because it is very hard to uh, to project at the forefront where would be the best um, way to apply for such an, such a license. And currently, the large majority of our resources focus on applying for the organized trading facility license, as Nick already mentioned. Um, this, yeah, basically, it's a securities dealer license in, in Switzerland, allowing Lika to also operate an OTF. Um, and this, we. we we we're focusing so much of our resources on Switzerland for a number of reasons, um, and three of those are, are mentioned here on the slide. Uh, first of all, in Switzerland, this license would allow Lika to be the market maker to its own exchange. Um, this is especially important to us 
um, for something that Richard already mentioned is that we want to keep fees to an absolute, absolute minimum and even zero for, for retail uh, investors, um, which means that to, to generate revenue, we need to be able um, to be also the market maker to our own exchange. And FINMA has, over the, the recent past, proven to be quite a progressive regulator when it comes to crypto regulation. It is not as if um, they, they don't uh, ask any questions or, or as if, is they, if they go with, with, with basically any proposal, but they, they have been known to uh, think with us in this process and to come up with quite clear guidance on, on what they would need to see from us. Um, another uh, important aspect of the OTF is that we do, would not require the services of any other financial institutions necessarily. Uh, so, for example, custodians that you would need in, in other jurisdictions, um, we wouldn't need in Switzerland, which is important as still at this moment, the conventional financial institutions are still somewhat hesitant to work with, uh, with crypto services. So this really allows us to scale much faster if we can keep everything in-house. And then another uh, license that we're focusing on is the investment firm license in Cyprus, um, which we are very close to a final approval. Um, the, the importance of this, this license lies in the fact that from the OTF, we cannot offer our services uh, to a majority of, uh, of European uh, uh, countries, or at least that's what it what looks like. And um, so these European investors would need to be onboarded by a, an investment firm within uh, the European Union. Um, so that is why um, we're, we're going for the Cyprus investment firm license as well. Then to wrap up, there's, uh, here's some, uh, some, some recent regulatory achievements. Um, there's the provisional approval for the, uh, for the, the license from CISEC, the Cyprus investment firm license. Um, which, which I just mentioned, um, which is very important for us. Um, also in Singapore to be able to, to also there um, offer locally going forward. Um, we, we needed a stored value facility license, which, which we have obtained from, uh, from Master Local Regulator. And in Australia, we have registered as a digital currency exchange, which is also a require, requirement to offer our, our services locally there. So that is it for uh, for regulation for now. And with that, I hand back over to Richard. So I want to thank you for participating at this coin holder meeting. But now key is for you to go to the coin holder meeting 2018.blinker.com website. And please kind of vote there, but also ask your questions because I'm sure we have raised a lot of issues and have not answered all your questions. So looking forward to that. So I want to thank all the people within Lurke, but also outside you that you have been our supporters to support us and join us in this long journey of building a global exchange across that asset class, which is fully regulated and has liquidity and is fully professional. So the real market is there for the grabs. Thank you for helping us. Thanks.